Greetings from Shed Sound Studio here in rural West Virginia. My name is Ian Beabout, and today I thought I would like to talk with you about the brand new release from Jethro Tull entitled A A La Mode. This is the latest in a series of fantastic new stereo remixes and surround sound mixes by Stephen Wilson and Jethro Tull. Um, so what do we get in this package? We get the original album remixed in stereo and surround sound. We also get, um, I guess, five, yes, five associated tracks, including Crossfire Extended Version, Working John, Working Joe, Take Four, Cheerio Early Version, Corey Whisk, which is a completely unreleased track, and Slipstream Introduction. On disc two and three, we get live at LA Sports Arena 1980, um, which is interesting because this is the first time that Stephen Wilson has remixed a live concert. Usually he refuses to do live concerts. He only does studio albums. But in this case, he has um, done the entire concert in both stereo and surround sound. Uh, so on DVD 1, we get the album and the extra tracks in surround sound. DVD 2, we get live at LA Sports Arena. And um, DVD 3, we get the Slipstream video, which has been remixed in surround sound. So how did all this turn out? As you know, um, I am a major, major Jethro Tall head. Um, so it has been nothing but a joy to go through and listen to all of these mixes. And I've heard a couple of these several times. Um, in fact, I think I've heard the surround mix for the album about five times already, and I've only had it for a couple of days. I am really enjoying this thing. Um, so I do feel like um, Stephen Wilson took a lot of creative liberties, especially with the, um, the original album. Um, you have... For the first time, you have tracks that travel around the room. Like, specifically, I'm talking about a moment in Filingdale Flyer where things get a little bit um, almost psychedelic for a few moments. And I think that there's like violin parts and keyboard parts that float around the room. And I love it. I find this stuff absolutely charming. And um, I'm happy that uh, Wilson has taken the effort to do this. The, um, the concert is, I think I said it's like being there, but better. Uh, it might actually be better than being there because the way that he's mixed this, he's not mixed it in like an audience perspective where, you know, you might hear the music in stereo and then some reverb in the back or some audience noise in the back. No, you hear guitar parts flying around the room. You hear drum parts, drum fills going from one side to the other. Um, you know, for instance, Eddie Jobson's keyboard solo, which of course ended up as part of the Green album, um, is it's really a, an immersive experience. And I am so impressed by the work that's been done to the concert. In fact, I hope that this changes Wilson's mind. I, I hope that he decides to do more uh, live concerts in surround sound and stereo. Um, so one aspect of the concert that I actually really, really like is that usually up until this point, Tall would play a smattering of old material and only just a few new songs. Um, one exception would be the Stormwatch tour where they did play most of the album live. Um, but here I think every song from a is performed live, um, on the concert, except for Filingdale flyer, which I guess appeared in the set lists and part of parts of 1981. Um, it replaced working John working Joe. Um, but, if, but here we don't get Filingdale flyer. So we get everything else though. We, we get, a song that I never imagined to hear live in good quality, and uh, that's Batteries Not Included. That's always been a favorite of mine. I've always loved when Tall went a little bit weird, and um, you know this song is is certainly is certainly falls under the banner of Tall but weird. Um, so 
with uh, DVD 3, the Slipstream concert, this was actually one of the things I was most looking forward to seeing and hearing. Um, I think Slipstream may have been the first Jethro Tull footage I ever saw as a very young kid, probably under five years old. Um, I used to watch Slipstream with my parents. Um, in fact, when I met Eddie Jobson a few years ago, I even told him about it. That's, that's how much of a, a strong connection I have to the Slipstream uh, video. And, you know, Slipstream is, it's a bit dated, um, to say it lightly. Um, there are some moments of it which I think are absolutely brilliant and stand up to the, the test of time, and then there are other moments in it that don't. And it's very inconsistent. Um, I love the opening uh, section, even though the graphics look horrible. It, it's almost like a, a so bad it's good uh, graphic. Um, and, uh, you know, also under this, um, you know, under this uh, um, heading of so bad it's good, you have the Dunringell video, which is just, it's horrible. Like the, the video is absolutely atrocious to look at. Um, but there's something about it that I find charming and enjoyable um, when I see it. Now, on the other hand, the video for Filingdale Flyer is absolutely amazing. And, um, you know, I can see, like, elements of maybe Nicholas Rogue or even um, uh, even Ken Russell showing up in the cinematography and the direction of Filingdale Flyer. So I actually really like that video. There's one moment where you see Ian Anderson's head twist around unnaturally. Um, and that might be my fa my single favorite music video <laughs> moments from anybody. It's just so unnatural and so weird. Um, and I've never seen anything like it except for in this video. Um, and then there's also one part where there's a slow pan all the way around the band. And it's, it's, it's a single take. It's an unbroken shot where the camera travels around the band and I was watching that over the weekend. I thought, wow, the, the direction is actually surprisingly good um, in this old music video. Another highlight for me is the Too Old to Rock and Roll, Too Young to Die video. Now, this is kitsch British humor at its absolute finest or worst, depending on your perspective. And I see elements of Python and Benny Hill coming into play here. There, There's some, like, you know moments where you know it's almost like they're picking fun at in the way that you know that 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 those properties uh, approach women specifically Benny Hill it, it seems like it's making fun of it um and I love that it, it, it makes me laugh it, it, there's also a moment here that I can't believe is actually in the film um and that's when Anderson comes up out of um like a submarine or something and he pukes all over the place like it just it just cracks me up every time I, I see it and there's a routine um where the band are pretending to drink tea and again it's just so python like there's one shot of eddie jobson where i swear he looks just like eric idol and i love it um so this concert has um one of the best versions of black sunday that opens the show um, and I love how, you know, speaking of the opening of the show, I love how in Eddie Jobson's Slipstream intro, uh, you hear old tall songs, like you hear bits of Dark Ages and Aqualung traveling around the room. And so when those songs come in later, you know, especially Aqualung, um, which by the way has, I think my favorite image in the whole set. Um, and that's when Aqualung is sitting on the park bench and you can see the cross, above him. If you haven't seen it in a while, pay attention. It's my single favorite moment. But when you get to those older songs like Aqualung and Locomotive Breath, it's really great uh, to see the new life that has been breathed into these old compositions, particularly some of Mark Craney's drum fills um, that, that happened in the first few minutes of Aqualung. And I love the new wavy type feel that Locomotive Breath has on this concert, which is in no small part thanks to Eddie Jobson and his contributions um, to these shows and this album. So, yeah, Slipstream is one of the absolute highlights for me. The sound is fantastic. 
it sounds like you're there in the arena um, and listening to it. It feels like you're there with the musicians. And this sound quality extends to the complete show, the uh, the L.A. Sports Arena 1980 show. You know, it, it, it's unbelievable. Like, speaking of the uh, L.A. Sports Arena 1980 show, this thing is two hours long, and it goes by in a flash. To me, it's one of the more interesting tall shows, and it might be the best tall show that's come out uh, in these box sets. I, I, I think it's just absolutely phenomenal to hear not only the A-tracks um, performed live and very fresh, uh, but also some older songs like Skating Away on the Thin Ice of a New Day and... Um, um, Hunting Girl is really great with Mark Craney's double kick drum uh, in the outro, which I just love. It, it, it brings a huge smile to my face every time I hear it. Um, so I really feel like, uh, you know, tall fans, they, they often don't like this lineup. And I think it's a lineup that needed to happen. I, I think that it's a fresh, clean house um, after what was a kind of a, a, I don't know, I don't want to say anything bad about the Stormwatch tour, but oftentimes when you hear the older songs on the Stormwatch tour, things are a little bit more subdued. The band seems kind of bored with it. Um, so I like the freshness that Mark Craney and Eddie Jobson bring to the band, and of course Dave Pegg, even though you know he was on the Stormwatch tour. I, I feel like I feel like even Martin Barr is is more invigorated by the new blood in the band. Like you can really hear it on his Aqualong solo that Martin is having a great time. Um, so yeah, this is an excellent box set and I'm just only now starting to get into the, what is it? A hundred and four page book. It's like a small novel almost. Um, I'm just starting to get into this. Um, and I know that this is going to bring me a lot of enjoyment for a long time. And, you know, I haven't even mentioned the studio track, Corowisk, um, which is somewhat, I guess, of a spiritual sequel to Kelpie. Um, it's an instrumental, which I think I, I may have uh, said on the previous video that it was likely to be an instrumental. And, uh, you know, the first couple of times I heard it, I wasn't too sure about it. You know, I thought, you know, I can understand why they cut it from the album. It doesn't really fit with the album. But on further listens, you know, it started to pop up in my, you know, like in my sleep. Like I hear it in my dreams. So I actually really like Koruisk, and it's fun to hear um, unreleased music from this band for the first time in 40 years. Um, I am so happy with this set. I'm so happy with the surround mix mixes. I'm so happy with the surround mixes. I'm so happy with the stereo mixes. Um, I might even say that this is some of Stephen Wilson's best work. Uh, this is up there in terms of surround mixes with his studio records. Um, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of the future bites and I feel like he poured the same amount of passion into this as he did the future bites. It really shows. Um, and, uh, what else can I say other than bring on broadsword and the beast? Ian Anderson says that there's between 35 and 40 unheard tracks from the broadsword and the beast sessions. This thing could be the biggest set yet. And it has to happen. I absolutely cannot wait. And uh, yes, we are getting benefit by the end of the year. Um, that's what the official word is. But I know, speaking for myself, Broadsword and the Beast is like my, it's my grail now. Like, I remember I had a dream. We're talking about dreams. I had a dream like probably 10 or 15 years ago before even the box set started coming out that I got a box in the mail of tall records and on the back cover, like they were just, you couldn't even see the back cover image because they were covered in unreleased tracks. And, um, the two albums that I remember pulling out and being the most excited about were Stormwatch, you know, in my dream were Stormwatch and Broadsword and the Beast. So I think I even said that like when this reissue campaign started happening, uh, where we did finally get, the vault uh, opening and a lot of tracks that had never been heard before. I think I said that a passion play was the one I was looking forward to the most. So when a passion play came out, Stormwatch was the one that I was looking forward to the most. And so Stormwatch came out last year. Um, and now broadsword and the beast is my grail. Like I cannot wait. And uh, you know, after this, I am happy uh, to pick up as many of these as 
Ian Anderson decides to release. I don't know what's going on with this. I'm happy to pick up as many of these as Ian Anderson decides to release. Um, I will even buy Under Wraps and Rock Island and, you know, all those sort of lesser loved records. Um, but after Broadsword and the Beast, the one that I am most looking forward to is Roots to Branches. And the reason for that is because I saw the tour. I was barely three years old and I saw the Roots to Branches tour. So please, Ian Anderson and Chrysalis Records and whoever's putting this out, um, don't stop after Broadsword and the Beast. Go through, do Under Wraps, do Rock Island, do Crest of a Knave, do Catfish Rising, and especially do Roots to Branches. We must have that. Um, I want a show. I want everything. I even want the solo records. I would even love to hear Walk into Light remixed um, or Divinities remixed and surround. I, I don't even think we have heard any live material from Divinities. So please keep these things going. All right. Once again, my name is Ian B. About. And please, if you have um, a a la mode, let me know what you think of it in the comments. Let me know how it compares to the previous releases. And, um, you know, let me know if you're looking forward to Benefit or Broadsword and the Beast or anything going forward. I would love to hear from you. All right. That's it for me for now. Bye bye.